quick orientation to hear all those skulls. Actually, can we shut that door on that pork top one? Yeah. And then, uh, maybe. Yeah. Military surplus. Oh, that's yeah, that's interesting. Got out of whack. All right. Um, there's a list over there that describes all those skulls, and so you can figure out what they are. All these pictures, this is all from a researcher, Galen Rathbun, who's a retired USGS biologist who's looked at elephant shrews in Africa for his PhD and still does it, has found two new species in the last, since I've known him, 14 years in, in Africa of elephant shrews. He's also, it, th these pictures up here are all from him. He's traveled around the world. There's a key up on the wall as well as a key over there for those. And he put the skulls together because he went from elephant shrews to manatees in Florida to uh, sea otters here and to red-legged frogs and stuff. So it's really, I have him as a neighbor and he's really helped out a lot. <laughs> and then uh, the Chinese seaweed fishermen here, they lived actually in this house till they moved this structure here in the late uh, 90s. And they knew enough to go down, if they burned the high intertidal rocks, first it was with hay and later with propane torches, that they'd kill all the algal spores and ova, uh, weedy green out seaweed would come in and settle. And they could harvest it in the springtime. So then they dried it in packs and shipped it off to Chinatown and, and, and uh, up to the city, and you know, some to China as well. And then the um, other one, the <laughs> Japs, Peril, Manila. Um, that was December, was it December 21st, 1941? And that, that was, they sunk the Montebello. It had three million gallons of oil on it. It just loaded up in San Luis, where you were today. There used to be a big oil thing right there. You've talked about the whole oil history of that. And it sunk about eight miles offshore here. And that picture on the right is actually on the ranch here. And uh, one of the guys in that picture, Art, was actually here when I got here. He was in high school then. His father was managing the ranch, and he came back and managed it from 87 to 2001. So I got a great oral history from him. Plus, he was here for that event. And you could, how they survived and nobody died is amazing. One lifeboat came ashore here, and two more made, got towed into Caicos. And I, was, I might as well on that topic. They came, and it's Noah had a big project to look at sunken ships as potential ecological disasters, right? Because they've got all this oil on them. And the, they even start, one of the reasons they started looking at them was that there was these intermittent oiling of birds off of San Francisco. They looked at the data and it correlated with big long period, like 20 second period swell. And so it was pumping this water out of the Lukenbach, a boat that was sunk offshore a couple hundred feet of water. It would pump the oil out with these big long period swells. So they correlated the oceanographic stuff with these uh, oiling events. And then they thought, well, what about all these other sunken boats? And so they came out here just Oh, it's now it's five years ago probably and they took an ROV down and they wanted it and drilled through the holes to see if there was any oil so the bad news was all the oil was gone the good news was all the oil was gone because you don't have to spend any money dealing with it but it's, it's out there if you've ever been to Santa Barbara oil sort of goes becomes one well with the environment again eventually so it was off anyway so that's the Montebello story and then the MPAs we'll talk about more um, and they're over there and if you need to put stuff that Cupboard is, is mouse proof if you shut it up at night, and as well as I think those um, filing cabinets can be too. Okay, so let's go. Can now everybody's got a screen? I'm gonna just try to point and we'll see how this works. Uh, oh, that worked. Okay, so that's that's an oblique view and knows the perimeter, and you're sitting right at the lower red. You see that there? You guys can all throw. Wait, give me a little pointer. Wow. Hey, you just do this. No, that's from this angle, no. <laughs> anyway, so we're, we're sitting right there at the base, that, the lower edge there. And it's two miles of coastline, about a half mile wide on average, and about 600 acres. And we'll talk about it, but there's 225 acres of Monterey Pine Forest. There's this coastal terrace prairie, and then there's uh, coastal scrub, and then there's the kelp beds offshore, and the rocky intertidal. There's only one sort of pseudo sandy beach in the middle of this whole thing, which we'll hopefully see tomorrow. If I can just hit that and it goes, right? So that's that same picture again, and here you are sitting up here at the top, and that's just a different angle of that hole. And it's the White Rock Marine Protected Area offshore of us. It extends up coast of us and down coast. It's about three miles long. and goes about a mile offshore. We'll talk about marine protected areas later. And this is University of the Coast. I just thought that was a cool picture. They did an article on this in the paper. Just University of the Coast. I like that one. Anyway, and that's if you get up to the ridge, you can look out. And these pictures, these are all flowers taken from here. And that's what the ridge looks like looking out uh, over the reserve. And in this picture, you're sitting down over here in the corner right now. 
we gonna have time for that? What's our schedule like tomorrow? Uh, I think we might. If we get up early. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the mission, the goals, the history, the facilities, how what happens here in use, and a little bit about habitats and management and stuff. Um, so the UC system, the mission is to, to learn how to protect the land and to facilitate university research and education and to learn by doing <coughs> management techniques. And it was founded by three faculty members in the late 60s, Ken Norris being one of them, and this one was named after Ken, uh, one of the founding faculty members, and Mildred, Mildred Mathias, and the other guy just died, actually. I'll think of it. Anyway, they had, they had sites where they were studying lizards out in the desert, and somebody developed it, and they said, oh, we need to have reserve areas. Because you can't really do it on private land, it may get developed. You can't really do it on public lands where people come around and disturb things and don't, you know, dogs run around and they got to pick up the thing. Oh, that's litter or trash because experiments are there. So you need to have these protected areas. So now there's, I think that now there's 39 of these and hundreds of thousands of acres, a bunch of employees go from the redwoods to the deserts to the uh, snarl up in the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. And ours is just north of Point Conception, 80 miles north which as you may or may not know is a big biogeographical barrier, both marine and terrestrial stuff. There's a lot more rainfall north of Point Conception because the ocean currents, you know, come up and from the south are warmer from the colder north. We cross Point Conception, now it's raining, so that must be true. There you go. And there's cold upwelling water, which plays significantly here. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well, um, which is more north of Point Conception phenomena because of the wind patterns. That's actually a good one to bring up. They been couple things said one about the offshore here is the upwelling it, due to the upwelling is one of the factors that ocean warming is not happening in our section of the coast or our section of the northwest the, what is this the eastern pacific and redwood trees look like they might be doing better with global warming because you get the inland masses heat up winds come on shore more upwelling more fog and they might do better in the fog so the coast may actually get cooler here in California, right here, right here in Northern California, Northern California, where we <clears throat> where we get windier and colder. So it's very interesting in that regard. Um, anyway, that's the same thing. I don't know why I've got that slide there. <clears throat> oh, there, I lit them up. These are the UCSB reserves, um, which is not important to you because by that UC, I work for UCSB. And the history, do we talk about the? How do I get move this uh, down? Arrows, other arrows. You want to grab that an arrow? No. I just killed myself. Okay. Oh, over there. Okay. So, what, that one? Go, uh, I don't have, yeah, I have no idea what's going on with this one. I think I stole it from somebody. It's too many tricks. Next slide. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so, this one, this just shows the different habitat types in California and how the reserves are overlaid, and, and we seem to capture most of the different habitat types in the state. And I told you about the ones we have here. And also, this talks about the marine protected areas. And I got involved with this Marine Life Protection Act, which I'll talk about more. And a bunch of UC reserves are coastal, Bodega Marine Lab, Big Creek, where you'll be at tomorrow, Anya Nuevo, um, Coal Oil Point, uh, Santa Cruz Island, and then down off of uh, La Jolla uh, Shores, too. So all these different UC reserves have a marine component. Long arrows, long thinking. So anyway, what do we do? These badgers actually took this picture here when I first got here. I haven't seen them for a few years, unfortunately. Very cool critters. Do you know they dig and chase gophers underground? They can dig so fast. And they're also mustelids. You know what? How about other, what are other animals here? Might be mustelids. Anybody know anything about mustelidae? Skunks. Skunks. Very good. Yep. Good predator. What other? Well, offshore. I'm gonna give you an ocean one. Ocean mustelid. It's a it's an order. Is that right? Of uh of mammals. Mustelas, and it means they're predators mostly sea too. Sea otters, otters yeah, they, exactly. Sea otters. Yeah, see. Yeah, sea, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> sea otters are mustelids. Sea otters, skunks, well, yeah, black tailed weasels we have too. And then, uh, and the other famous one is not here, but it's wolverines. So I actually got a picture of a wolverine in the Sierra exactly not long ago at another reserve up at Seychelles. So, yeah, <clears throat> mustelids are very, they're just, they're predators and very cool critters, that's all. Um, okay, so I've developed and promote <coughs> teaching and research opportunities. Uh, I take care of the facilities and access by, you know, facilitating cl 
class visits like this, as well as researchers coming. Um, provide background data and equipment, which we'll talk more about later. On-site expertise, well, I have a master's in marine science, but I've learned a lot about terrestrial stuff uh, over the years. Um, and you got to meet the requirements of the use agreement with the owner, which makes this one unique. So this is the only facilities that we have access to. All the other buildings where my family lives, the white adobe up there, the owner's um, vacation home, or not even vacation home, home. And the green roof is uh, over there. So all those other are off limits. The owner actually allows us to use it under six-year use agreements. We're into our third six-year agreement. They fund the whole thing. They gift all the money to you. UC that then hires me and works for it. So they kick in all the cash. So this is a unit of this larger network, but it's 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 Every, a temp. It's it's a it's an intermittently repeat, uh, permitted one. Renewable. The other one's a renewable. For life. Nope. Nature Conservancy renews every five years at Santa Cruz Island. Oh, okay. Uh, water District, LA Metropolitan Water District takes care of own Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Labs under Lang Land. Yep. So there's a lot of these places that are, have different unique things. Some are law owned, some aren't. See, I'm educating the man, man. himself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is, I wish I had a bigger screen for this, but this is coastal um, San Luis Obispo. And, uh, and the purple is conservation easements state parks and reserves. The green is agricultural easements under the Williamson Act, and the black is urban areas. So the cool part is there ain't much black. <laughs> it's all, it, I mean, that's it. many urban areas. There's, um, the green is agricultural. This is the Hearst Ranch conservation easement. Do you guys know what conservation easements are? Okay, so that's, uh, the Hearst Ranch one was 90, almost $100 million when I first got here, early 2000s, and this, it limited development on its 90,000 acres of Hearst Ranch to 27 homes, private homes, 10 employees' homes, all on the east side of Highway 1, out of side of Highway 1. And they could develop a 100-room hotel in San Simeon Cove, which you may or may not go by tomorrow. Yeah, we'll go by. stop by there. And then it allows, um, they own three points still. They own that, the point at San Simeon, they own a point south of that and they own a ragged point um but uh, not the restaurant ragged point since you'll drive by but the actual ragged point south of that and the rest became state parks so that's what the state got for 100 million bucks so anyway that's why that's that big big purple area up there so, so it's sort of cool we haven't ever stopped there before because we haven't had time we might for maybe 10 minutes just park and go into the visitor center there if you guys ever have the chance you should definitely go tour hearst castle that's so uh, way too much time for us We'll pull in, but, but that whole dimension is a very interesting one. Um, it's the third largest single point tourist stop in the state. I'm going to guess in the other two. Yosemite. Yosemite, good one, yep. Yeah. Another one. It could be the happiest Disney place on Earth. Disneyland. Disneyland, yeah, yeah. So those are, the, those are the top three. So lots of people come by here, which is sort of cool. And the uh, elephant seals get lots of visitors as a function of that as well. Right, so that's, that's we'll see, we'll go, we're visiting the elephant seal dozens tomorrow, and they'll tell us about that. Oh, you got a, you got court cooked up with those guys? That's great. <laughs> and then um, we're this little purple area right down here, and we're not labeled because of our pseudo-temporary status, though the owner of this place is actually a big-time environmental person. They have their own foundation, do their own thing, um, so it's pretty secure in that regard. Um, yeah, so hopefully it'll carry on. And then there's state parks down here, national forests back here. So Slow County Coast is in pretty good shape compared to many places of the California coast. And I bring this up because the Green Valley Cattle Company abuts us. And they have 600 acres that abut us and go down to Highway 1. That's sort of Highway 1 you can see disappearing over here. And here it is drawn here. And then up in this section up in here from 46 North, to the big Santa Rosa Creek Danish, they have another 2,900 acres. So the Fiscalini family, or one branch of the Fiscalini family, still has 3,500 acres. They run about 600 cows on it, um, the cow-calf operation. Um, a lot less now because of the drought. And I get to work with them because I brought grazing back. We'll talk about the grazing as a management strategy for our grasslands. So it's sort of cool working with the full-time cowboys. And it makes it easy because you can just bring the cattle right across the, uh, the gate and you have a use agreement that coordinates with them. Geologically underlying this are nine alluvial fans. 
This is called the Cambria slab between Cayucos and here when you disappear. So we have these short drainages, a couple of blue line streams, the one you just drive across coming in, that's talking about the restoration potential for that. And another one down by this house we'll see in the bluff tomorrow, the Casita. So some of you might not have had water resources, so do you guys know we oh, say sorry, blue, blue line, line stream, stream. What we mean by that? So it's, it's uh, back in the day when we used to have these more traditional maps, if uh, an area was a perennial or near perennial water source, they, the, the generic map symbol is a blue line, meaning that it's uh, either always a stream or almost always a stream. And so that shorthand term for, term for blue line stream means essentially waterway. And so that's become a shorthand term for folks that are talking about resource management might there be wetlands there? Might there be uh, amphibians there? That kind of stuff. So blue line stream would kick, by default, tends to kick in right. additional so It checks. kicks the Army Corps of Engineers, actually, right. does it. And the Army Corps of Engineers then has to step in if you're going to do anything to that stream. And it's a seasonal stream, and it, the perennial part is not so much the water, but vegetation right. counts for that perennial nature of the, that so stream. It's, so it's, a, it's an effect that, even though it was originally back in the day not created as a management tool, it's become a key trigger for um, additional scrutiny, um, whether it's true or not. Because sometimes people put it in and it wasn't really right. Sometimes they did not put it in when they should have. So it's not perfect, but, but that's, that's Or, or as I worked on it, there was a project next to us here, and there, I'd read the review of the project, and they said there were no native <laughs> plants. And I dragged a couple people who knew more about native plants to me and go, oh, there's all sorts of native one plants right here. here. Yeah, right, right here. Property. And so it's a blue line stream that comes down and goes to that thing. And they wanted, they had it, hired an engineer who wanted to make these big trapezoidal channels in the, this coastal stream, which wasn't really correct by Coastal Commission standards. So I spent some time and pointed it out to him. And his, he said, oh, yeah, those blue line streams are just random. They don't draw them. So when he <laughs> talked to an engineer, they weren't that keen on it because it was affecting his uh, progress of trapezoidal channels. Anyway. And we've had a... a Geomorphologist come out from the University of Plymouth. And he's mapped all the uh, sediment fascia all up and down the coast and taken cores and looked at it. So we looked at the, uh, the other maps were drawn by Tony Garcia at Cal Poly, who was a UCSB graduate. He's a professor now, and they mapped all those alluvial fans. And then we've got we're going back to the prehistoric stuff, and and it's uh, Terry Jocelyn, who's a UCSB grad student, took her master's degree and extended into a PhD thing. And if you look on the bluff. You'll see the fired red rocks. If you go up this creek bed, you'll see the grinding stones uh, for the acorns. And in front of the owner's big greenhouse, where she dug a pit, were red abalone shells dating back about 5,000 years. And they're solid, big, rabbit abalone shells. So what, what else might that tell you about the ecosystem here? What, what key stone species might or might not be here if, there were, if there's red abalone? Otters. Otters, yeah. So it suggests that maybe they all were wearing cool fur coats. Uh, but because they wouldn't have intertidal red abalone that they could access without the absence of otters. So the otters may have been taken away at the, whenever they were har harvesting all these things. Um, and it's, they've done middens at Santa Cruz Island. These abalone are cyclical in time, too. They go up and down. And the other thing we'll talk about later that's sort of interesting is there's not black abalone in these pits in any number. And there's been a big black abalone die off since 82, 83. They're coming back slowly now. But maybe those die offs, you know gone through time, like the red abalone population has gone up and down through time. Um, and the reason I say that there's no otters around, because there were red abalone intertidally here in the 70s until the otters came back again. And the otters, when they came back and recolonized, the re humanly harvestable red abalone in the intertidal went away. And those are the archaeological sites along here. And so it's really fun when you walk, we'll walk, we'll see all these pretty shiny abalone shells. So you get this bioperturbation where all the um, gophers and the um, Ground squirrels have turned over, turned over the uh, abalone shells. So you get glittery spots here and there. And then this is actually right here where that mobile home is. And then the um, <laughs> this reminds me of another good weekend. So I was looking at the light at the outhouse. Somebody dropped their iPhone in the head last week too. That really made my weekend. <laughs> anyway, why did they fish it out? No, they, they go. Can you fish it out for me? So I, got the, <laughs> I got the gloves. Anyway. <laughs> It didn't work, so why did I bother to fish it out? You got, you got an eye glove. I got an eye glove, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that was here until they moved this year. And this, that was with the Chinese fishermen lived in that thing. I just thought it's a cool picture. And it's really cool because 
her outfit is just way too cool. <laughs> and they tore down that house when they put the mobile home here in the late 90s. And it, if you go back to the 1930s, and that map was on the, Oh, it is, right behind you there, leaning on the wall. So you can look at it later. It's, it shows white rock, and it, and it, so you can see the forest here. And you can see that they were tilling the fields. Down here is actually where they were tilling the fields. Um, so who made that soil conservation service? That yeah, matter? some USGS group, I think, or soil group, yeah. And so you can actually see what they were doing, the extent of the forest. You can see the tilling. And we'll talk about the grasslands here, but they actually tilled the grasslands until the 1950s, and they planted this stuff called harding grass following that. So it's sort of neat to get this sort of longer history. There was a dairy ranch here as well until the 19th. 1940 when the previous owners bought the property they turned it into a cattle ranch and it was a dairy ranch from the 1870s I should do a little Cambria history because Cambria's got the fourth largest quicksilver mine ever in the world we all know what quicksilver is mercury, is mercury? forgetting gold yeah yeah so there was a large Chinese population came down to mine that I think these coastal Chinese camps were a spin-off of that and the ranchers didn't care if the uh, families lived on the coast and took stuff from the sea that was sort of just happened here they had an ab Moved down and further down the coast, and so these little encampments. Actually, Monterey Bay Aquarium is great because that was all. If you look at a picture in uh, the library, it was all these houses in a huge Chinese colony, yeah. all, all that all in the whole PG area. But anyway, so we had a big Chinese population working the mines, um, and then the, in the 1870s, this Fiscalini family and a bunch of other Swiss Italians basically hit California from here all the way up through Sonoma County. So all these Swiss Italians came in. It was a big economic. Yeah, it was actually, that's, I think that's when the, uh, Italy became, went out of city states and became a nation for the first time in forever. <laughs> so there's a lot of displacement, a lot of folks came to the coast. And, did, and the dairy farms petered out in the 60s in general and became more cattle. This one was ahead of the curve. We talked about that uh, in that slide already. And that's the dobe that <clears throat> the family lives in and is the house built in the bluff. It was built in 1940. They used... Um, clay and bitumen and um, straw in, in the uh, making of it. And bitumen, <laughs> bitumen, bitumen, I say, I'm saying it wrong. How do you say it? Bitumen. Bitumen. Bitumen is actually what the, the stuff, the, all the oil they're getting out of uh, the Dakotas is. Awesome. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, they're still using that. Yeah, I just heard that term. You don't hear it very often, that term. And there's the owners. This is, oh, so if you go to CaliforniaCoastline.org and you want to show anybody where you've been this weekend, anybody know about CaliforniaCoastline.org? It's great. We've not talked about it. Yeah, but, happen. yeah. Okay, okay, well, bring well, it up. I, I, my voice is going out when we're talking about Coast Commission. It has to do with, uh, we usually talk about it then, but yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm going to introduce you to it quick. It's a fun website because what it is is this guy bought a helicopter, had his wife trained to fly it. He bought a really good camera, and he'd go up and down the coast every year and take pictures of the coast, and I've just extracted that from that. So a whole coastline documented. In addition, others have gone back. I think Gary Griggs is one of the main players in that up at UC Santa Cruz. And they've got historic photos of the coast online. So there's one website, CaliforniaCoastline.org. You can go pictures and look back in time so you at can, the coast. You can rock the whole coast. So it's like that. It's, it's, it's oblique. And you can, you can step, 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 step from the northern, from the Oregon border down south. Or you can jump. You can type in a Latin law and you'll jump there. And all of the images are public use, so you can down, you can look at them and you can download them. And so uh, the big driver was uh, Malibu again, the bane of our existence sometimes. Um, some of those photos were of wealthy people's houses, and in particular, um, Barbara Streisand. Some other people did not like the pictures being online. So this was this sort of predated Google Earth to a, to an extent, at least the start of the lawsuit. And it, she basically, they basically said, you can't put this up online because this is my private property. People are seeing into my house. And long story short, she, the, the, those folks lose the lawsuit. And so then it's declared this can be public, uh, you know, public resource. So the coastal, was the Coast Commission or Coast Conservancy? I don't know. One of them, one of them kicked in a little bit of money. Conservancy nice kicks website. money in. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, it's, so when you guys are doing anything for your capstone projects, for a report, um, it's a great resource. I mean, you can obviously use Google Earth, but Google Earth is not as maybe helpful at times. It doesn't give you the same perspective. And so if you want to look at how, many, uh, how people actually use the coast, such as um, people vacationing uh, on the beaches and stuff, the CaliforniaCoastline.org is, is usually much more. And there's also another resource for that. They've done LIDAR of the coast, too. They have a 
to go to, I think it's a yeah, no so website. So now we're getting ready to do it without LiDAR. Yeah. So it's the new drone stuff with the image software will get yeah, you close. Closer. All right. Not as good, but, but still within a centimeter yeah. or so. And I still want to get out there and flip them off one time just so I get in the picture. You know, but I don't have time to do it. And the other thing I want to show on this, if you look, see that green stuff? This is called Kakuya grass. And that stays green year round. It uh, comes from South Africa. And this pasture here, and we'll talk about it when we walk more tomorrow, had one horse in it when I got here. And the owner had stopped grazing in the whole north end. And that one horse kept that Kakuya grass from coming into this pasture. But you can see how far it grew out of the drainage and went that way. And it also grew up this way. So, and this is Disticulus, another a native grass, actually, but just creates a nice front to it. So you could go back and look at these th patterns through time on the photos. And actually, I hope to do that with the, the uh, pine forest. And I, in addition, I've taken, I take annual pictures uh, from the bluff to try to get a panoramics of the, of the coast, is, of the pines and the, the coastal front itself. And that's the owner's house you'll see, and that's the adobe right there. Should I get the casita in there? No. But anyway, so there's another map. There is your R and the UC residence, and there's the excluded areas are in purple. That casita is down here and is excluded as well. And yeah, you see, so, so here we go. So this was 1972, and you can see the neighborhood. And now you can see 2005. So you sort of get that feeling of the contrast of just how fast the place has developed and the impacts it might have and why reserves like this, even though up against an urban system, is quite important to have that. And there's the coastline.org website. And we do some stuff like barn restoration or maintenance projects here. So we redid the Redwood Barn, top to bottom pretty much. <clears throat> Put a little roof on it. We've done dairy shed restoration because it was a dairy site before. Now my wife milks the Nigerian dwarf dairy goats we have here in, in it. Just saving footprints. Camp Ocean Pines is a very, it was given away to the YMCA by the previous owner. It's 12 acres that we surround and they have an easement across us. And if you ever get to the point where you want to sponsor a meeting or a party of so $75 a night gets five five meals, I think. And overnight accommodation and bunkhouse five accommodation. Meals? I want to say that, but I might be lying. I thought it was five meals. So that would be breakfast, lunch, dinner. Brenner. Dinner, brenner, breakfast, lunch. Anyway, it might be, maybe it's not five meals, maybe it's four. But anyway, gets you a day, gets you, and if you have a big group of 60 or 70, and I've hosted several meetings up there of 70, 80 people. Um, And that's the sunset over the facilities. Am I done? No. Okay. I don't think so. Uh, so who uses this reserve? I think actually, is that your class, Sean? I can't remember. All right, well, B, that's up on the ridge again. And so in 13, 14, we had 16 classes use it. 309 different students came. 21 different research projects. 18 of those were actually new. 16 were in the marine and five in the terrestrial. This pond hasn't seen water for two years. I just got done digging dirt out of it. We'll see, we'll see how dry it is. But it was the home of red-legged frogs, and there's the rocky inner tidal on a good low tide. Do we have a good low tide? No. So, so, so when we have a low tide, we actually so we'll do look an at yeah. Survey, we haven't done that for about two. So there's a, there's a um, that's the casita, and that's the low tide. So you can imagine that when we go out there and look at the casita tomorrow. We'll see. The casita is my favorite. Yeah. If the world ended, and I had to move here. I would move. That's where I would move it to. Even though it has some. Yeah. Small what is that? No, it doesn't. Not much anymore. It's nothing. It, okay. You'll see it tomorrow. So there's the marine protected area. There's the coastal terrace prairies. There's these bald hills where it gets elevated more. There's our Monterey pine forest. We have a couple little ponds. So that just shows the different habitat types, which we'll walk and explore tomorrow. The rocky intertidal. There's the UCLA marine botany class stuck in the intertidal. Uh, Black Do we know the Black Abalone story? Uh, just very briefly. They don't know. So what happens is, in, back in the early 80s, if you went out to Santa Cruz Island, there were black abalone stacked on top of each other. There were tons and tons of these things. And then 82, 83, El Nino came, which is super warm waters, huge swells, knocked down all the kelp. Um, so the kelp, there was no more drift algae for these guys to get in the intertidal. Water got warm. This um, bacterium, I think it is? Yeah, rickettsia like yeah. yeah. Took over and started dying. They all started dying off. And a group that's actually coming tomorrow We'll be surveying the sites here, but a site is three plots each with 20 abs in it, so like at least 60 abs total. And they had sites from the Ch at the Challenge National Park monitoring program picked it up. And then Pete Ramonde, who does has sites from Point Conception, well, to Alaska. Actually, he's got it in the San Quentin to Alaska. But um, <laughs> for the now the 
Bureau of Energy and Management <laughs> Group. Which, which they have that has yeah. bought it. So the Bohm Group, they've got it. He's got it from a point conception up to Point Sierra Nevada. And so they watched him die off up to Cayucos. And if they saw one animal have the, this withering foot, which is basically starvation, um, and they came back six months later, boom, the whole site would be gone. And that happened up to Cayucos. But here it Peter slowed down at Piedras Blancas and Point Sierra Nevada. So I got here, it was stable for about three years, and then it slowly went down to about a third of what it was. And now it's starting to, it's been stable for there, and it may even be increasing ever so slightly. So I just saw a uh, talk this last weekend. Good news, uh, they don't move much. It, on the Channel Islands, it is increasing. There you go. And a new uh, master student from Fullerton has just resurveyed a bunch of sites from Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA, Orange County. And uh, not a lot, but there's evidence that most of these sites there are starting to increase. There you go. Cool. On the islands. On yeah. the other yeah. Nice. Anyway, so these and these guys are counting Ladia out there, and uh, I'll be out doing that at seven o'clock at night in the dark, in about three or four nights. <laughs> so this thing is this weekend. Which actually. is one of the things we do if it's a low tide. Not, not at night, though. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, it doesn't take that. Yeah, this is way down at the end of the ranch. Oh, so this this brings up another good point. It's these Ladia. So that when I first got here, I watched Owl Olympus. Owl Olympus. Yeah, these Ladia Gigantia, the charismatic megafauna of the uh, invertebrate megafauna of the intertidal. Because they do, they have their own little home space. So they carve out a space and they graze. And guys have done time lapse, and other limpets will come in. And a time lapse looks really cool because they'll get them and they'll flip them over and knock them out. I mean, you'd, you know, you'd be there for hours to see this, but if you do it with time lapse photography, it's a very cool process. Um, and they're sequential hermaphrodites, so they all start out as little boys and they end up being you know, big females. Um, but I see these guys carrying sacks back, right? They'd come down the intertidal and carry these sacks back. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I'd call Fish and Wildlife, and I'd call Fish and Wildlife. And they finally hung out, and they busted them, and they got like 75 pounds of these things. And the wardens got them, and they, well, they had an intertidal license. They got them from here? Yeah, from here. And it's like the third or fourth time I'd seen them doing it. How many times I didn't see them doing it, I don't know. Um, and it's a group from the Central Valley, and it's sort of a cultural thing to collect these things. And... I mean, one time they were walking on their bluff, and I just go back to the inner tile. They can't walk on the bluff. But they're so heavy. I go, well, don't take them, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Get some sense. Um, anyway, so the 75 we thought was about 2,500 of these Lottie Gigantia. So I got on the phone the next day, and I found out they live like 30 to 40 years. Yeah. They rarely recruit. Um, you know, every five, 10 years, you don't see how many new babies coming in. Um, and... I talked to a fish and game person at the time, and she said it's been illegal to take them because the warden thought it was still legal to take them commercially, but it had been illegal for several years, so I had to enlighten the warden to that fact, which then they had to go back and change their citation on that stuff. So anyway, that's what motivated me to get involved with this Marine Life Protection Act stuff, which I'll talk more about later, is seeing people take these things and how much of an impact you have. And we actually had a researcher come because it will change your whole sexual process. Well, if you start taking a lot of them, they'll change to female at an earlier age as well. And a guy at PhD student published some research on that. And so uh, when I teach cons bio, we do this uh, at Leo Creo. You guys have taken cons bio. Did you guys do yeah. the intertidal Lottie surveys? Yeah, so that's it. So you guys know the story. Do you see a lot of Lottie? Uh, no, yeah, they're, they're small, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so areas that humans have access to, like Don's saying, people pop them. So on average, they're small. In places where people don't have access to, they're big. And if you guys are in need of a research project for uh, next year for a capstone project, a great one is to go to some of our historic collections. People have done this sort of, but to look at some of these resources that might be exploited and and look, use museum collections or like skulls that Don had, or stuff like that, and actually measure the size and then compare them to the actual size now or size in, in different uh, human accessible areas, different degrees of human accessibility. And an interesting story, almost always. The, um, there's actually a, red, a good red abalone story like that at Stornetta Ranch up north. Pete Ramonde oh, yeah, right. had done a bunch of research there. And it was essentially an, uh, a marine protected area in the fact that it was private property. Nobody could access it. Well, the, it got public access. And within a year, the, everything was taken down to size, the legal size limit, quite quickly. And he did some modeling that suggested it would take it like at least 100 years to come back to it's what it was reduced to in a year. Yeah, so the population some, some undergrads back. from Humboldt were doing a poster this last weekend, and they, they found a new site that is being proposed. To, mm. it, it's a, the state just acquired the land, and they're proposing to open up the gates. 
so they went in and found all these huge abs, uh, big yeah. abs. And so their argument was don't open it up because the student, t the, like this. Right. Like that Using a Stornetta model. Yeah. 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 Same, same. They're worried the same story of pointing out. And hence the idea of UC reserves not necessarily being public access or just a different space. Uh, oh, the sea otter stories. You got lots of sea otter stories. Should I tell them like I Sure. Start? Okay, because we're not going to have the sea otter yeah, back in there. Yeah. yeah. So to catch them and tag them, you've got to use 100% O2 rebreather so you don't have any bubbles. You use a diver propulsion vehicle. They sneak up under him. They catch him in his Wilson net. They pull it off. They put them in a little box. You take them in here, in this case, San Simeon Pier. The, you know, the otters might look small. They're actually. No, well, these, that's, we'll get to that part of the story. But these are all 40, 30, 40 pounds. But they do get bigger, but we'll tell That's you. That's so big. Yeah, and yeah, and they're and they're and nasty. Um, and so you t and, and you have to worry about them overheating, right? When you put them in a cage, because they have such a high metabolic rate, because they have the fur, right, with a million hairs per square inch, or more hairs in a square inch, and you have all uh, on all of your head. Um, me. So, <laughs> so anyway, they're very. That's why there was a demise, right? Because they uh, Russians came all the way around and engaged the Aleuts and came all the way down to the Channel Islands and knocked them all out. But anyway, so they catch them and they put a radio tag in. Rectally? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, oh, oh. <laughs> Sir, they surgically implant the radio tags in it. And the radio tag gives you both... Uh, yeah, both locations. Yeah, no. <laughs> You're telling me to get out of the outhouse. I can already tell. Um, <laughs> The, um, they to give you location and body temperature. And the location is really important in identifying individuals' behavioral ecology because then you can look at what they're eating, the size of the thing they're eating, how that changes over time or seasons or oceanic conditions. You can look at reproductive success and then the females and how, they're, how many babies they might have and how successful the babies will be, how good their parenting is. So they get all this great individual data. And some of the things they've discovered are the longer they've been in a site, the more specialized feeding they get. So like the ones that have been in Monterey for, because they came from a very reduced population in Big Sur and they went up to Monterey and they, and they didn't get down here till the 70s. And that population of Monterey has been there so long that there's guys that stay in a kelp bed, they eat snails and crabs, and they get lots of snails, these small tegula, but it takes more processing, but you get, it's easy to get them, right? And then others will get urchins and abalone, but it's a lot more work to get them but you get a bigger reward and everybody gets crabs. And then there's others who go out in the sand and they'll get clams and crabs, everybody gets crabs. <laughs> and, uh, and they'll feed on the sand. So they specialize, and then they even teach their young how to do it. So they get specialized in it too. It turns out even talking about cows, cows train your offspring what to eat as well. It turns really? Out. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. Anyway, so yeah, there's this whole parental thing going on. And a couple of the interesting papers, they got one paper talked about the, um, they started looking at the otters here. They, in the early 2000s, they first, when I first got here, they did a project, and they wanted to know why the population wasn't going south and expanding as much as they thought it would be. And Jim Estes, who's done this work for 40 years up in Alaska and here, and called them keystone species, forever thought it had, it, they're the top down, they're controlling the environment, they eat the urchins, the kelp comes back. Um, and it's gotta be some sort of human perturbation or something's keeping the population down. But they tagged a bunch that they translocated to San Nicolas Island in the 70s. And they're all eating big red abalone and urchins out there, except for the one that came from, was still a, one of the founder or the translocated ones was still eating snails because they've been taught to by its parents. Um, but all the new ones were eating the good stuff and they were big. They were like the Alaskan ones, like 80 pounders, right? 70, 80 pounders, so it's the small big. And so then they, they changed the whole paradigm that it's maybe food limitation on the coast keeping the otter populations down. And for Jim Estes, who's a very much top-down kind of guy, it was a big shift. Yeah, actually, I saw him at an otter meeting, Southern, Southern, Southern California Sea Otter meeting. Uh, I mean, not Southern California, Southern Sea Otter meeting. And um, he just said, Tim Tinker taking over his lab and turning it all around was the best thing that ever happened to the research for otters, which is pretty amazing for a guy who was pretty... I know Jim, I've been to Alaska with him on research projects and had an office across the way, so hence it's very interesting to me to watch this progression. Um, and anyway, and your other paper they did was on uh, toxoplasmosis in sea otters. Everybody know what the protozoan parasite heard of toxoplasmosis? It's in most of us, actually, or a lot of us. And if you're pregnant or you have an immune deficiency issue, um, then it'll, it'll be a problem, but otherwise it's not that big an issue. Same with otters, pretty much, but the ones that had it the most were the otters eating snails off of uh, Cambria here. And they have to go from, they thought they went from cats 
into the marine environment, into snails, and then otters would eat the snails and then come back around again somehow. And so they did a bunch of work. The UC Davis vet people down at um, Morro Bay and looked at cats and the genetics. And they was thinking, maybe I don't think that could be the source, especially for the ones up here in Cambria. So then they got a bunch of NSF money. And they wanted to look at, well, could it be sea lion that's going through? And could it be the mussels they're eating? So they sampled sea lion poop out on the rock. We have up to 80 sea lions on the rock you see tomorrow. They sampled the mussels below them. They sampled the kelp uh, plants and the snails on the kelp to see if the snails had it. Um, and then we did it where the at Santa Rosa Creek where there's no sea lions, but there's freshwater input. And then they, they replicated that at Point Lobos with sea lions and Carmel River with no sea lions. So the only place they found toxa was in Santa Rosa Creek, a small percentage. So that's the first time they've shown that it could actually be in, in a marine system. Um, I had the fun job of collecting the poop. But it's much better than being in Davis and getting the poop, <laughs> I thought. So I had, to, I had to kayak out, chase all the sea lions off, slam onto the rocks, scoop the poop, and ship it off to Davis. And, I got to go diving for marine snow and snails and other stuff. So I had a fun part in this. Now they're proposing more stuff with this to see. Anyway, following up on it. So there's sort of a lot of neat otter so research that's been going on here. What was the final answer from that first round? Uh, they, well, they do. They, it does have toxo. It can be in the marine environment. So I thought it was that, but that didn't seem to be the... It, and they did it during drought years. So they didn't get much fresh water, which is very fascinating. The sea lions have been proven to go through. Sea lions do have salmonella running through them as well as some other stuff. Brucellosis and all sorts of fun diseases, why I wore gloves. Uh, and so there's this is working on the papers now. She's got like half a dozen papers getting ready to come out. So she just sent me a list of in, in press or in, in, in the writing process. Um, okay, so that's it about otters, about the otter stuff. And, and we just had a people living here for a year who t they got money from PG&E because they proposed to do some sonic testing off Diablo Canyon. They never got approval for the testing, but they did fund a year's worth of auto research. So I had three auto researchers living here for a year until about last summer, really. And this just shows the otter populations going up and down over time, and they're fluctuating around 3,000 pretty much for the last bit. And there we are. That tells the, that tells the story I just told out on the rock with the kayak. And the protozoan going through the system. And everybody knows what Pisco is. They've been to Chile, right? It's a liqueur you drink in Chile. No. The story is they were drinking this liqueur in Chile, and they came up with a partnership with the Interdisciplinary Study of Coastal Oceans. And they did a whole bunch of research. These major universities got funded tens of millions of dollars, and they've published several papers, lots of papers on this stuff. And one of the sites is right off here. And if you go to their intertidal site under Pisco, after you get through all the drink recipes, um, you can see a, a topographical map for this particular plot in the species list. And they have this for sites up and down the coast. They've done comprehensive surveys. Um, and now they've sort of morphed into a group that's also doing marine protected area monitoring because it's very important to look at these marine protected areas. So th this was an endeavor to um, try to create an, a, a region-wide long-term monitoring data set, not necessarily driven by any one particular question, but rather to look at how things change over time, intertidal and subtidal systems. And it was funded by um, foundations primarily. Packard's the first year, and then the second one was the uh, Moore and the Packard yep. Foundation. And so, so it funded a lot of research at many universities up and down the coast. It's since, uh, it's since, not been renewed. But, um, but it, it, it did a lot of groundwork. And so even if if nobody gets any more money, it's a great snapshot that we could repeat twenty years from now, let's say, and see how things have changed. Um, so. It, an example yeah. of it's thirty million dollars worth. Of yeah, it's ten yeah, years and thirty million dollars worth. Of money. Yeah, a lot of money. And part of it was also into um, I don't want to say public education or research, but it, it is. It's about getting that information, information dissemination. dissemination. Yes, getting the that, information out to the public. Yes, so that was a fraction of the overall. Right. And and Jane Luchemko, who was one of the PIs, became uh, the NOAA secretary, secretary of NOAA. So she was the one that was in charge of NOAA. During Mm -hmm. Still in charge of Noah. Didn't she? Did they change her? I think she still is. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they re yeah. I think she still is in charge of Noah. There you go. Um, anyway, she started out as a Pisco person at Oregon State. And there they are. On this, that's the Rocky Reef out here. This is sort of the only bench reef we have on our on the reserve. 
which is why they picked that. Most of the other places are more cobbly, bouldery stuff. And that's, there you go, Alex. Alex, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the way. <laughs> that's the right, I think, most of it. Is there any left in there? I think the upper right one's a left, and the rest are all the rights, right? Yeah. That's right off here. And then, so they did that. So we just talked about all that stuff, how they swim along. And, do, and so when, before I got here, I was the diving and boating safety officer at UC Santa Cruz. Before I that, I was Sean's boss. <laughs> UCSB, and I ran a lab for some folks down there. So I trained people how to do this stuff underwater. And that's it was my first kind of science boss. So, so uh, Lubchenko out of office February 2013. Oh, there you go. Catherine Sullivan is now the secretary. There you go. Cool. Can you yeah, tell me what cool. Jane's up to? Uh, <laughs> Never mind. She's retired because her husband seems to be wanting to be retired. Ah, okay. Right. Anyway. So that's counting underwater if you decide to go to subtitle research. So what is MLPA? Did it, guys, what do you know about the Marine Life Protection Act? We haven't talked about MPAs very much yet. Oh, well, I'm going yeah, go to give it. you a bunch of BS. So the Marine Life Protection Act was 1998, and it included a couple different parts, but one of the main, it was the nearshore fisheries that part to it, and one of the parts was to set up a network of marine protected areas throughout the state, taking advantage of the best available science and and doing it. So they went through, and it's actually the history of the political history is sort of fun from a management perspective. Because basically, the law was passed, and fish and game at the time didn't want to have anything to do with it because it meant you're going to take less fish, which isn't you know, fish and game. It's not fish and wildlife at that point because they were into taking stuff. <clears throat> and so they got some scientists together and they proposed these network of MPAs. And they went up and down the state. And when it got to Morro Bay, at least, I know, because it happened just when I got here, around 2001, um, everybody got up in arms and said, oh, we need stakeholder input, we need stakeholder input. So this is an important point to remember, the stakeholder input part right at that point, because mostly fishermen whining about this, right? <clears throat> so then they come back and they get some money and they try to do it from the World Wildlife Fund, it's not enough money, and they run out and the department doesn't have the motivation, so they still don't do it, and they peter out again. And then somebody from, gets hold, from the press says Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't like this law and is not a good environmentalist. <clears throat> Arnie gets pissed. So then Arnie tracks down $7 million from the California Natural Resources Legacy Fund, which is Packers are a big funder of that, and for the process. And so they, the process ends up being a blue ribbon task force. You always got to have a blue ribbon task force. Not a red ribbon or yellow. It's got to be the blue ribbon task. They overhauled the fundamental way that they're going to do it. Approved. Right. So no, not really. No, because the Fishing well, Game Commission still has to approve it at the above. Okay, right. They so made this the whole subset. Yeah. So they had. Then they had this. This is for to get all the stakeholder inputs. Then he had a, the blue ribbon task force. He had a scientific advisory team that set up the parameters. Then he had regional stakeholders, and regional stakeholders were recreational fishermen, commercial fishermen. Divers, um, people who ran kayak and recreational businesses. I represented uh, scientists and educators who used the reserve, my clients, so to speak. Um, and so, so the president of the Ab Farm that we didn't meet, Brad yeah. gave us a tour. He was he was a that's right. That's where I met him and got to know him. Yeah. So we had all sorts of the different stakeholders involved and a bunch of enviros. Okay, got into it too. And the stakeholders worked. Heard the parameters, staff, they had a staff doing it, giving us information. We got the parameters, we proposed these things. They went, got feedback from the scientific advisory team. We modified them because given the best available science, they had to be a certain size, a certain spacing based on what we know about larval distribution and the how big old fat fish produce bigger eggs and better eggs than anybody else. So this is one example of this information. We had input into all this stuff. And they wanted to protect certain habitat types, you know, wetlands and sandy and rocky habitats. Went back and forth, and then it went through the Blue Ribbon Task Force for approval, and then it went to the commission. And it did it region by region. And our south central coast was the first region from Point Conception to Santa Cruz. And so that was the good news, bad news, but the first one. So everybody was sort of sorting things out. Anyway, so by the end of it and doing all the different regions up and down the coast, which this one's been in place for nine years now, Eight years. 2007? Yeah, so seven years. Seven years, right? Because we did a five year meeting, so it was two years ago. Seven years, yeah. And the last one was put in place just two years ago at the most, even that. 
Yes, but San Francisco Bay, the internal bay has not been done. Yeah. So anyway, so they got all that done, and essentially eight to ten percent of the coast is no take. Um, another ten percent is limited take, and it's usually deeper waters where you can fish in the pelagics, not on the bottom. So the silly part about all this effort and all this energy, if they just taken what the scientific advisory team said at the beginning, there'd be less protected area. So they all the fishermen complain. But they let the enviros in as stakeholders. And so they ended up with more protected area than what they were offered at the beginning. <laughs> so here you are, millions of dollars and hours later, and you ended up with more protected area. Which is good for the environment, but if you were whining in the beginning, watch what you whine about. It's the old, uh, you know. Anyway, just be wary of what you ask for, because not all stakeholders are on your side. Anyway, so that's the map, and that map is replicated over there, and it's online. They've got more information than this stuff. And it's the only network like this in the world of this stature of this size and magnitude so it's become a model for world kind of stuff and there's all sorts of spin-offs of monitoring stuff and different management stuff associated with this which i'm sure you guys will get involved yeah. in and hear more about the it, monitoring mostly sucks no. so there's almost no money for monitoring the efficacy so programs like pisco that weren't that, that you did don already mentioned which weren't necessarily set up to monitor the effectiveness of this protection area but you know, just to look at stuff, um, have borne the brunt of this, and they've they've tried to adapt their monitoring or added sites. But um, you know, huge expense to do this, very small budgets to do the monitoring. So we just participated in a data collection effort for this area, actually, mm. where the the essentially the agency is saying, hey, by the way, who's monitoring stuff in this part of the state? Because we want to get your names together, because we would like your reports. That, that's, I mean, that, 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 that's a bit facetious. That's not the entire monitoring effort, but it's that kind of thing. It's not starting from first principles saying, hey, we did a perturbation. Let's assess the effectiveness of this. Like, we did a perturbation. Hey, here's a few dollars to do little things. And then somehow later on, we'll say if this thing works or not. Just like everything, restoration, all the stuff we talk about. If you don't monitor it, you don't know why something worked or why it didn't work. And you're going to keep screwing up over and over again. You're going to keep wasting time. You're going to keep repeating mistakes. So monitoring is a key part of management, but often not funded. Yeah, it's a hard one to fund. And it, just, it provides long-term data sets. As we know, long-term stuff is critical. Anyway, so there's the marine protected area drawn offshore. And it only goes about a mile offshore here. Um, and it goes beyond, there's a reserve borders, and it goes beyond the reserve to the south and to the north. And another funny part is to the north, we said, regional stakeholder groups said, no, we don't want it here. The Fish and Ga Wildlife staff suggested a bigger one, and I think they suggested a bigger one here in a state marine park where there's no commercial fishing just up coast from it, adjacent to it, um, with the idea that it would re it'd get rejected, and it didn't. <laughs> so they ended up making one that the regional stakeholders had hoped to keep it open for kayak fishermen and stuff just north of the reserve, but it didn't work because the department got yeah, greedy or, I don't know, they were thinking something different. Um, oh, the whale's tail, we'll talk about this tomorrow. But it's cool to see these pictures, because when you look at the whale tomorrow, they won't show like this. What's that? Do they leave current pictures in here? No, no, you, why? Why? why Bring your current, <laughs> current picture will be in your mind's eye tomorrow. <laughs> so anyway, the whale's on the beach. So my wife smells this thing, goes over, looks for a sea lion, doesn't see it. It's a 25-foot baby gray whale washed up. You can see the big teeth marks in the middle left. Killer whale teeth marks. Tongue gone. You guys, Blue Planet? Anybody yeah, seen that? They the tongue. Yeah, the they jaw. separate the mom and the calf, drown and baby, eat just the tongue, and a baby spirals to the bottom. In this case, the baby didn't spiral to the bottom, but ended up on the only place we have access to it. Um, and so what we did is tied it up to this post right at this little drive area we've got. And one day I flopped it over with a tra my small tractor. And another day I did another rock with a small tractor on high tides and big swells. I had a New Zealand swell and a high tide. And I was able to get it moved a bit. And then I called the guy with the big toys in town. And he brought in a 17-ton wheeled front loader. Actually, just drove it from around the corner <laughs> over to here. And we dragged it up into the pasture where you'll see it tomorrow. And that's what it looked like. And that was me out doing some of my first uh, flensing work on it. But a lot more needs to be done. Uh, there was a class that came the day after it came up. Actually, we were collecting bugs that had already been attracted to it. And there's the vision of what a Vende will eventually look like, but it's got a lot of work to do, as you'll see tomorrow. <laughs> what a great project. How long has it been there? Project. Three years now. Oh, wow. It's 
still not fully decayed? No, you know, but I gotta get to it because the bones are getting frayed, so I'm gonna have to resin up and sand the bones as well. And right now, my excuse is there's not enough water to pressure wash it, so. <laughs> wait till it's drought. Yeah, yeah, wait, yeah right, right. wait for a drought and then find another excuse. And then you'll go see the elephant seals, which are nearby here and are quite, see, oh, so that, that brings up another good project that's not gonna be on the slideshow. So as part of that toxoplasmosis study, they had oceanographers involved and we had temperature loggers up and down the coast. And so I'm still maintaining a mooring buoy for these guys out here with some temperature loggers just on a, as a side thing, because there's not that much data from this area, right? This, this guy's keen on the data from this area. So in addition to that, we, we tagged a great white shark logger on it. So this acoustic receiver, here's the great white sharks within 250 meters of it. And they, the sharks have all been tagged at either Año, Fairlands, or Tomales Bay. Do you guys know about the studies that they've done? No. No. So anyway, they've tagged probably, I think, half the population in each of those places. The first time they tagged them, the shark, Sal Jorgensen at Monterey Bay Aquarium has done this work. Um, and they tag them. And these tags go in, and they release after a year, and they don't have enough energy to give you the data, so they just send off it like an EPIRB signal or signal to a satellite, and you got to go find the tag and then get it. So position, after you, Position. Data. Position, yeah. The depth. So yeah, no, well, no, well, you grab the, the unit, you bring it back and then you can download depth and location. So they get, they come up and they find them and they're like 200 meters from where they tagged them a year later and they're going, they haven't gone anywhere. But you download the data, they've all gone to the tropics, dive to 200 meters and come back. So the Fairlawn ones go back to the Fairlawns, the Anios go back to the Anios, and the, and the Tamales go back to the Tamales. They also discovered that when killer whales show up, they all take a hike and disappear. <laughs> um, and they haven't even tagged the ones here at, at, uh, that are hanging out at Piedras Blanc because I'm sure feeding on the elephant seals there. Um, and we had between 4th of July and Labor Day 2013, eight swim by out here. So, and that's not even local homies, that's just in transit guys. And when they're in transit, they figure they just swim right by and go down. And then Santa Monica Bay is where the babies tend to hang out with a guy who got bit not long ago. Swimmer, but um, yeah, most of the adults are up and up here feeding on elephant seals and sea lions. We have had somebody, we have, yeah, we saw somebody see a sea lion get totally eaten out here. While well, I was out on a trip, sea lion eating right off our rock. The guy came back with a boat early from the sea otter research stuff one day. I go, what's up? And they, they watched a harbor seal get eaten off the beach up here. I got back one day after, yeah, I got back one day after, yeah, after diving and I, this woman with a camera was taking a picture of this little sign at the top of the boat ramp just in town and set out a, the sign was about the guy who got hit in the kayak and shaken out of his kayak the day before, which is, I'm glad I didn't read the sign because I just spent about three hours in the water. So anyway, yeah, they're around. <laughs> we are. Can't wait till he starts tagging him here. Ooh, we get really exciting then. Anyway, no, the elephant seals are now more here than they are in Agni Nuevo. They were thought to be extinct at the uh, beginning of the last century. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, and they've expanded from the Channel, from Guadalupe Island to the Channel Islands. Um, the biggest population, I think, is San Miguel. They went up to Ani Nuevo, and then they've worked their way back down the coast. Uh, this spot up on Big Sur, and then it, this, like I said, this one now exceeds with 4,000 pups being born a year, on average. So conservation success story, right? We thought this these guys were gone or extinct, and they've repopulated a huge. Mm -hmm. Basically, the thought is now they're numerically uh, at or larger than they were um, before humans started whacking them. Right. It's, before there was motor oil, there was marine mammal oil. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What else do I want to see about elephants? Oh, you'll just find out tomorrow how they dive to 1,500 meters. They spend nine months at sea and 90% of their time underwater. I, and when I worked at UC Santa Cruz, another office next to me was Bernie LaBeouf with they, you can't help but avoid seal, elephant seal research because at Santa Cruz, they did a lot of that stuff. And uh, now they're using them for oceanographic data too. But they started out just paintballing them and looking at the ones coming back to the beach. Once they found out they came back to the same beach and colony in general, then they put instruments on them and they found that the males swim off to the uh, Bering Sea and they do this twice a year and then females swim out to the deep ocean. The males get a better food supply but are at higher risk in the, up along the Aleutians. Uh, but they have to be big and bad to claim a piece of the beach to have their hair on. While the females just want to make sure they get back to the beach, they're out feeding in the depths in the soft bottom. 
But again, 90% of their time underwater out of the nine months a year they spend out there. It's yeah, just they're incredible insane. animals. They look insane. like big, fat, lazy things on the beach, and they're just like the water machines, right? Diving. Yeah. It's all this deepest diving marine mammal, deeper than sperm whales. Anyway, they're very cool. Uh, so anyway, there's our graze. This is the grazing story. So when the current owner bought it in the late 80s, there was a middle of a drought. The rancher was feeding tw each cow about tw average of 20 pounds of hay per day, so that it was bare dirt here. So they stopped all grazing on the north end, and they allowed grazing on the south end. I watched weeds grow up in different patterns in the pasture without the horse, like I showed earlier. And up against the fence, you see Italian thistle, kukuya grass, and wild radish just growing up against grazed areas. And so learning about grassland management and whatnot, I brought cows back, and we've set up sites look at grazed and ungrazed sites also this coastal terrace prairie goes up from sonoma county down to the next point south really point bouchon and after that so the inland grasslands come out because there's less moisture and there's a i think i have the paper data but if you look at these mean numbers of different habitat types inland grasslands that then come out to the coast south of point bouchon pine forest the coastal scrub anyway the mean number of species is huge in these coastal grasslands Mind you, a lot of it's not native, but there's a great, greater, uh, greater diversity in the coastal grasslands than there is anywhere else. So, so just for a point of clarification, technically the stuff here, the, the grasslands here next to the coast, are called coastal prairie. I usually use shorthand, or people sometimes use shorthand for grasslands that are at the coast by us. Mm -mm. Technically, those aren't coastal prairie. Those are essentially inland types of grass communities that are just near the coast. So this, this coastal prairie is heavily influenced by fog, and that pretty much drops off. Uh, South of Bouchon, yeah. Point conception. Yeah, and Bouchon's so. the last one that Gray Hayes thought was Bouchon's last coastal grassland. So. Again, that's that big dividing area. We talk about marine biogeographic stuff, and we also talk about that there. Speaking of which, just biogeography, sorry, I gotta throw this in here because I'm thinking about it. Lobster babies by a mooring buoy up in uh, in Monterey Harbor. Wait. Little baby really? lobsters running around. Yeah, yeah, I forgot I was talking to a researcher from Santa Cruz. Anyway, another biogeography phenomena, yeah. And then people have been talking about otters and things eating them up there, and so now they're seeing little ones. Yeah. Pretty cool. Anyway, the reason coastal grasslands are unique is that, and you can help me with this one, Sean. So the native grasses adapting to the Mediterranean climate have grown meter long roots and live for hundreds of years here. In Europe, they're more annual likes. They grow shorter roots, that they grow really fast, and they put out magnitudes more seeds. If you put the equal number of seeds in a plot, as some researchers at UC Santa Barbara have done up at <clears throat> another reserve, the natives will outcompete them, but they just don't make enough seeds to outcompete them. <clears throat> so the other guys just get all, this, all the resources, mostly water, grow really fast, put out millions of seeds, and overtake the native grasses. Why didn't the European, why did they evolve differently? That was my question. Oh, I think it's because they've been disturbed so much. So, so the, so. You think there were perennials in Europe before the disturbance? Yes. Uh, yes. There's yes. been centuries of disturbance yes. in Europe. So, so basically, our grasslands, not just, we don't have good models. This is an example of a management story where the um, people weren't collecting data and then the communities were completely obliterated. So a lot of our models now come from, um, railroad right-of-ways where nerdy people a hundred years ago 120 years ago would walk to collect things and, uh, and so we don't have a good sample but in any event what we think was going on is we think that the picture on the left was probably what native grasslands were like they had a grass and they had a bunch of forbs a bunch of flowers when you look at the Bierstadt paintings when you look at the when you look at the big famous uh, uh, um, Hudson River School and sort of nature painters, they always painted California grasslands with color. Greens and reds and poppies and all these flowers because there was space. <coughs> the grass grew slow. So an individual grass, we've had an individual grass tagged for 40 years that someone labeled and it's been living since. But when you run the models for how big these, these perennial clump things could be, they could easily be 400, an, an individual could easily live for perhaps 400 years. So these perennial grasses were very long lived potentially. And they seem to be, oh, they sort of physically just sat here, right, and occupied the space. 
The big switch was one, a massive drought that happened right after the gold rush, two, the massive stocking of non-native ungulates and the removal of, of uh, and, and then, and then their, their removal um, of them and the manipulation of them, leading to um, a, a huge loss of biomass. So all of a sudden we had these, these natives that essentially held space by physically holding it, were munched down to nothing, while we introduce all the things on the right in Don's picture there. So a lot of non-natives that were annual, uh, following annual life histories. And that, that seems to have switched us into what we have now, which is when you guys go to a grassland, you see something that the Native Americans from 150 years ago would recognize almost none of those species. Very, completely different ecology, completely different system. And we will never be able to, well, yeah. We'll never be able to go back to the left picture. So it's a new ecology. But, um, but any, any other sort of thing that's come from that ecology-wise is, 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 is that the old one ecological model was succession. You just let things go, and the natives will all come back and take over. But that doesn't work. No. It turns out there's uh, a yeah. stable state. Right. So that, and these non-natives will just take things over. It's hence, I brought grazing back as a means of disturbance and slowing down. Can you the, tell a great story? Let's see. Do I? Yeah. So there's Gray Hayes, he, and he surveyed, this is one of the first projects here, he surveyed these prairies up and down the coast where they grazed, and he found overall, he didn't find as actually, this site was an exception because he did find more native grasses on the grazed area in terms of diversity and abundance, um, but he found better forbs up and down the coast than in grazed areas versus ungrazed areas. Um, but the native grass is not so much so significant, again, except for specific sites, but overall he didn't. And so he did this. He was one of the first to do a survey of this stuff up and down, looking at grazed, gray, looking at grazed versus grazed, <laughs> and then grazed sites. And I've learned a lot from gray. It's even funnier yet because gray dated a housemate of mine before he even found out about grasses. And even funnier, he's, a, he's another great sort of science story. He was this enviro who hated grazing when he started studying, and they That's became the story. biggest advocate of grazing once he saw the data <laughs> and how how it altered states. So he. So he was totally an switched. He was an undergrad at UC Santa Cruz, and he said, grazing sucks, man. Cows sucks. They're not, not native, man. And so has anybody been to the campus at UC Santa Cruz? Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of land, right? A lot of open land. Yeah. And so he led, as an undergraduate, he led an effort to petition the university to get the grazers off these pastures. And so they were successful, and they pressured the administration, and they removed the contracts to have grazing. They thought they were awesome. Within a couple months, these areas that were grasslands became thistle forests. Weedland. No one could do anything there. Animals couldn't move through it. People wouldn't recreate there. It just sucked. Um, and so, they, so the short version is he realized the grazers serve a purpose, right? Particularly in an annual grassland-dominated system. And if you remove the grazers, all this crap grows up. <laughs> And so then that's a real did, take notes on that one. Yes. Then he went to grad <laughs> school and did the study, and then said, "Oh no, actually, you have grazers." And that's so, the, 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 that and the Jim Estes stories are these great stories of how science just changes evolved, your stuff. Yeah, evolved. yeah, yeah. So he had it totally wrong, and then realized that, and then changed it back. So, so if you have grasslands, they need to be grazed or burned. They need to be, they, Some sort they of disturbance. disturbance. Otherwise, they end up being a monoculture of weeds, pretty much. And so our grazing program started with Bertha, who passed away this last year, unfortunately. She was a pet cow raised in the Palos Verdes Peninsula, who at least 1,000 students have been able to pet a 2,000 cow. Big 2,000 pound cow. And she was a lap cow. She was just such an affectionate thing. But, and if both of those have passed away. Bertha in trouble. Actually, my, somebody pointed out she needs to change that. They were our first grazers. <clears throat> and those are, those are actually milk thistles behind them, and how massive that is. <clears throat> so then we got more grazers. So now we get, got introduced to the local cowboys, and we've got <laughs> more grazing and cultural diversity as well as cattle diversity. And now we are, my daughter's now 9 and 11. You saw Stella today. That was her a few years ago. Um, sampling grass plots with Carla D'Antonio where we have grazed versus ungrazed. And that's a huge swell if you look back. Washing over white rock. Yeah. Oh, and so Monterey Pines. Let's see if I can do this from my head. So there's only five native stands of Monterey Pines left in the world. Three are in California. Here, 
a Pacific Grove and up by Anya Nuevo, Swanton Ranch, Cal Poly's Reserve, actually. And Pacific then, Grove is basically Monterey, right, right where we're going to go by. And then Isla Cedros and Guadalupe Islands in Mexico as well. And so does anybody have any guesses oceanographically what's common in all those spots? Bubbling cold water. And which fog. results in fog, yeah. So these things are much more expansive. They went from Sonoma to the Mexican border. And then with the reduction in rainfall since the Pleistocene, become much more limited and the fog has helped them uh, survive. Work, <laughs> I collected samples here that I never to analyze, but work has been done out at Santa Cruz Island where you can look and sort of cool stuff. You can actually collect fog, collect rain, collect water from the tissue of the tree and then see at what times of year how much is each is contributing to the actual uh, the tree itself or how much is in the tree, telling what the water source is fog or rainfall, which is pretty fun stuff. Um, but anyway, so it is the most cultivated conifer in the world. So if you've been to New Zealand, South Africa, Chile, Australia, Spain, and you see rows and rows of pine trees, they're probably Pinus radiata or radiata pine, as they say in New Zealand. In New Zealand, I think it's the second or third biggest ag crop right behind sheep, believe it or not. And they sell it mostly as pulp, but I do have a friend up in the Bay Area who's bought paint, no, he treated and primed barn boards, one by 12s from Monterey Pine. So. They do sell some lumber out of it as well. So it's quite, become quite a great, it's like eucalyptus we tried to do here and we didn't make any money on it and it's become weed. This has become a weed in all these other countries, but at least they're making money on it. Christmas yeah. trees too. Yeah. Yeah. I went to Australia last year and just saw just huge plantations of pines. That's it. Just huge, huge rows and forever, for, for just miles and miles and miles. That's and they're all stacked perfectly just like agriculture. Yep. You know, in, in Camarillo or something like that, just stacked in unison. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how the process and these guys grow that fast that's why they're so good at it and um, yeah they make lots of babies grow really fast and there's an interest interest in these sort of native genetic stocks because all those are grown from clones so they just take cuttings and keep growing them. so there's some thing like I say it's the most cultivated conifer in the world uh, five native stands what did I miss anything else oh there's this pitch canker this disease came in when I first got here, everybody was going to say, they're all going to die, they're all going to die. It's the old chicken little effect. And I said, well, how many are being born? How many are dying? Ah, oh, we don't know, we don't know. So I've gone and set up four different transects and different size structured stands in the forest. So hopefully we'll get a look at tomorrow a little bit. Um, and I've been trying to follow them for like 12 years now. I got a professor at Cal Poly interested as well in helping out and doing projects with it. And I've got another guy who's looking at the ectomycorrhizal fungi within these things. So these fungi that provide water to the tree but get nutrients from the tree and they attach to the roots and almost all plants have these ectomycorrhizal fungi and these guys would definitely need them and we've got a guy who got some national science foundation money and took trees from other stands and we planted out the seedlings to see how the seedlings are affected by these and if they're oh, yeah, specifically I I adapted he hasn't got he's still got still working on the data man you know how it goes speaking of which <clears throat> <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, you, I'll let you him tell. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna insult the man. No, so little is known about their basic demography. So I'm trying to figure out, because again, long term stated, nobody likes to collect that stuff. So how, how many are being born? And it turns out there's a million babies, and you know most of them die, but there's just so many. And it turns out actually, once they survive their the young stage, they've turned out they're resistant to this pitch canker. They would they be more susceptible as babies. So this massive number of baby trees comes out. The other cool thing is learning, working in a pine forest. I'm the marine ecologist. I don't know anything about pine forest. But you go in there with a pine forest, you go with a forester. He sees one thing, right? Let's optimize growth, get the maximum spacing, get rid of the little ones. You go in there with the uh, fire guy. Oh, let's get rid of all that dead wood and get rid of that and clear that out. You go with a park guy. Let's, you know, make it look like. Then you go with the ecologist. Oh, uh, well, I just want to know what's happened naturally, you know? So all different perspectives in the forest when you walk through it. It's really fun standing there with other people. Actually, I'm going to go tour the Bishop Pines down where they did a control burn down in uh, 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 Petros Ranch in uh, Montana de Oro. Ah. And uh, with the Sally Crenn, who manages the land for bg and &E, a plant pathologist from CDF who I got introduced to from the Forester, uh, new Forester professor at Cal Poly. So, Sarah. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so I'll get another we fun story. We have a student working on Tory Pines. Oh, uh, very cool. Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa Island. Sort of the same idea, like restricted distribution. Right. Then you think about forests at the coast, and Tory Pines are it, and then there's the Bishop Pines, which are Montana de Oro and at Santa Cruz Island, and then the Monterey Pines, which stop here, basically. So there's once you get out of here, you don't see many forests right on the coast at all.
And then redwoods start, well, you'll see them tomorrow where they start an hour north of here. And that's all rainfall, again, driven. Uh, so there are my pine transects. I got six years. I got to update that. <laughs> and then he's, there's Mr. Ecto mycorrhizal fungi. But, but did they work when you did the out plants? Did, did they yeah, well, yeah. No, they did, no, again, they did pick the drought year to do it in. We did get them out planted finally. I had to water them for several months, 1,500 yeah. plants individually. Uh, dry water or actually water water? What do you mean? With, with the gel and stuff? Or no, no, water? just water. <laughs> Bucket and <laughs> cup and away you go. So anyway, yep, they're getting results from that as well. So I'm not, again, that's a year later. You can't get many results. And then we've got this large pond. We've talked about draining and getting rid of these largemouth bass, bluegill, sunfish. Before we leave that, I'll just say that, right, so one of the challenges here, it's a classic thing. It used to be a stand of trees, right? But then as Don showed those pictures at the start, as the urbanization comes in, everybody moves into the forest. As they move into the forest, they say, this is a pretty area I like to live here. They move here, they go, oh, screw that tree. Let's cut those trees down. And there's the danger of fire. So then by humans being in an area, we talked about this with the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. As soon as people go in for fire safety, they by definition clear around. So people that are interested in going into a forest the very act of going into a forest often threatens that forest and that's what's happening yeah oh yeah my and my favorite is i have all these trees that border the town and once you cut one set of trees down they go well, what about the next one what about, so every tree's a, a danger at some level um the monterey pines are not good around houses they have shallow root systems they blow over real easy the monterey cypress make a better windbreak if you're gonna pick a tree uh, anyway, so the fishes, they eat, they eat the red-legged frogs, the pond turtles, given it's an artificial pond, who really cares, you could say. Um, and they introduced the fishes in it when the pond was built in the late 50s. And so we did, we're going to drain it this year, and we got a proposal to do that. But given that it was a drought, we felt rather stupid just draining all the water away, so we didn't do that. And then there's some, a lot more vegetation in the pond than there historically has been. And so we're going to survey it more and see if it may provide refuge. This is a bigger pond up in the forest, a couple acres. And there's the red-legged frogs. They're cool little tags on them around the backside so you can get location. And we did tag some in the lower pond, and it got, three of them got eaten by a giant great horned owl because you could tell from the roost and the marks on the tags. So they were, we knew the pond would dry up regularly, and they would leave the pond, and we were hoping to find out where. And they'd leave the pond, and another day later, we'd find them under an owl roost. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. And, and we have these voles. Uh, that run around and mice. We've sort of done some uh, work on small mammals in the grasslands. They have uh, done beetle surveys here, found how many species did I say? Three or four hundred? Three hundred ninety-nine, almost four hundred species. And 160 have been identified and even named one after me. I believe it was, no. And so it, it's cool, these beetle traps, they catch them going, flying upwards, and they go into a funnel, and they have a, a Another thing that hangs from a branch, a bunch of funnels that looks like a tree bark. They got them, they hit, and they go downwards into pit traps. They got our traps. They got pit traps that crawl and fall into. We went out at night with a generator and a light and caught them on night ones at sheets. You went around with a little, like, it's like a little hookah pipe, and you suck where you don't get it in your mouth. It ends up in the jar and the, the bowl of the hookah thing. Um, and, you know, you suck them out of cow poop. It turns out it's really cool. The beetles and cow poop are all European beetles that came over into cow poop. And there's none of the New World beetles have colonized the cow poop. I, sorry, I'm fascinated. <laughs> anyway, so the beetles everywhere. And he found them in the inner tidal as well, too. Uh, and then we've collected fog, and we're measuring the pine trees. And we do have some coastal scrub. We now, oh, this is a very interesting one. So we're going to have coastal scrub, and a guy's got some National Science Foundation money, and he wants to do a, a common garden experiment where he brings in seeds from other areas. But there is some concern is do we provide a refuge for sort of some sort of genetic integrity? So once this guy brings in seeds from another area, you can't really look at the genetics anymore. That question's gone because he's introduced a whole different plant. So do I allow it or not as a manager? I'm going to go to higher sources and let them decide for me. But this guy's got money, got this project approved. We'll look at the effects of global warming and how bringing in different seed types. But is that a, what does the reserve's goal in terms of genetic integrity? And you know, it's only going to be one researcher who's going to do that genetic survey, but yeah. Maybe I should make him do the survey and <laughs> be done with it. 
Uh, we've got all sorts of baseline data. If you got go to if you Google Norris Rancho Marino weather, it takes you to the Desert Research Institute, which maintains the data from our weather station that gets beamed up. Well, it's wireless now. It was to a satellite. It gets shot up wirelessly. We've got a, some of the subtitle, intertidal monitoring. We got the tree monitoring. We've got sea temperature stuff. Black abalone. We'll be doing here in a few days. We've got species list for intertidal. Sub no, not subtitle really. Intertidal and grasslands. And, and beetles, not insects, though. And somebody's looked at bryophytes. I still haven't got the species list, but not insects. More to do. We do have an orchid that shows up. It's not that big, though. Capria longata, which is pretty fun. And we have weedy challenges, such as the Cape Ivy that's covered areas. And your class helped pull out a different class another time. And I've been spraying. We've got Cape Ivy harding grass, which is a perennial grass was planted after they quit tilling it for hay. We've got jabata grass that's grown a lot. We've gotten rid of on coastal bluff areas. You can see how much it covered up here. We've got this kukuya grass. My wife was pregnant at the time. Uh, this grows the really green grass I showed you earlier. That was growing down a pipe. You can see how tall it gets. She's short, but not that short. And then we've got my daughters who've grown up here, and that's sunset and more surf shots. And that's at the Kursk, if you live here and you get in the right group, you get to go to Hearst Castle Pool and play. Super warm? No. It's really cold. <laughs> you gotta wear, we wear wetsuits. We're not dumb. Okay, I think that's it. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so uh, what Don was, was, was talking about before was the fact that uh, we came up two springs ago and helped to help them with the annual, annual monitoring. It was complicated by the fact we went home and then school immediately caught fire and that led to chaos um, across school. But um, but uh, last year we did not come up in the spring. But if you guys are interested in helping out here, Don has no shortage of tasks, both formal data collection stuff, but also just all kinds of other tasks. And if you guys are interested in helping out for a weekend or two here or there or whatever, um, you should... Uh, or you need a capstone project. Or you need a capstone. People next year need a capstone project. It'd be a great place We're to do a capstone facilitate project. facilitate research. A million impossible things to do. All right. So cool. And we'll, uh, what time do you want to? So, um, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, we want to leave here tomorrow um, by 9. So. Um, uh, it's we, after the hike. Right. Okay. Right. We want to drive away by 9 o'clock. So um, the question is, uh, so we at a minimum you go on at least a, a short hike across the bluffs. Uh, if people are interested, in, I think it'd be great if folks uh, were. It's a little bit might depend on the rain, but I think it'll be okay with the rain. But we can go on, on a, a short hike up to the pines, or we can go to, to the. You know, look at all these. The casita and the things. whale. Yeah. Yeah. So at a minimum, we'll start and do a little coastal bluff walk, and um, that would be great. So I think maybe we could uh, start that about seven thirty. Want to start at 7.30? Yeah, we can yeah. do that. Sounds about right. Give us enough time. So, um, yeah, so I think that's the plan. So 7.30, we'll meet and uh, have your, uh, have your um, uh, tent broken down, all that kind of good stuff, and we'll be ready and meet here at 7.30. Well, it's going to be really wet, your tent, though, at 7.30, but I guess it doesn't matter. You can set it up tomorrow afternoon. You have time to dry them out? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't know if it's going to get... Okay. All right. So I'll see you guys at seven thirty. And when you're done, and if you want to sleep in here, feel free in the trailers. I mean, to get out of the rain, it rains a lot, and it's getting sopping wet. Feel free to go anywhere. Uh, and then shut the garage door when you're totally done. Okay. Just last person out. Lights off. And the garage door shut.